Roll call. Gray? Here. Jerem? Here. Milton? Here. Pauls? Here. Thompson is absent. Gurnat? Here. Mr. President? Here. Please rise for the pledge of the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I just want to take this period of time to recognize the Ukrainian leadership we have with us here today, uh, visiting Omaha and Lincoln, as, as I understand it. Uh, they're hosted by uh, Heartland Family Service, the Studying Democracy and Free Enterprise. I know some council members had a chance to speak with them before our meeting. And we know it's a difficult time for your country right now, too. So our thoughts uh, are with you and your families and your countrymen, and we appreciate having you here. Thanks. Yeah, that was the invitation. <laughs> city Clerk certified publication on the Daily Record on March 21st, notice for a Creek Council and regular City Council meeting March 25th, 2014. A current copy of the Meetings Act is posted in white binder on the East Wall of the Legislative Chambers. Good afternoon and welcome to the Omaha City Council. This meeting is conducted in public and by law may only address topics listed on the published agenda. The Council will hear testimony but will not engage in debate of issues with the public at this meeting. During, test during testimony, it's not appropriate to applaud or convey disapproval. These actions only detract from the formal decorum of the meeting. At this time, please turn off or mute any electronic devices. Zoning ordinance on final reading and plan board attachments will take items five through eight if one case. Five. I need to read it up first. <laughs> Good point. Ordinance to rezone property located at 2102 South 105th Street from R1 to R2. A, plan board and planning department recommend approval. Six is resolution of preliminary plat entitled pull in place is hereby accepted. A, planning board and planning department recommend approval. Seven is resolution of three plat transmitted here with entitled pull in place is hereby approved. A, planning board and planning department recommend approval. And eight is a subdivision agreement is hereby approved. Now you have, a, we have a motion to lay over one week and continue the public hearing. Second. Roll call. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Milton? Yes. Paul? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Sampson? Garnett? Mr. President. Yes. It is laid over six to zero. Nine is ordinance to approve a major amendment to a major development overlay district development agreement to allow the installation of a 124 foot broadcast tower for the property located at 5933 South 118th Circle. A planning board and planning department recommend approval. Public hearing on number nine is today. Are there any proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Okay, Roll call. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Milton? Yes. Halls? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Adopted six to zero. Liquor? Item number 10, Rhythms Lounge and Bistro, 18041 Q Street. Class C liquor license duplication, new location. You have a request from their attorney to lay this over one week and continue public hearing. So moved. Second. Roll call. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Milton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. And Jerem passes the second time for a potential conflict of interest. It's laid over one week. Uh, five, zero, one passing. Item number 11 is Chicago Dog House, 3157 Farnham Street, a catering liquor license, no application, O location. Public hearing on number 11 is today. Are there proponents, please? Yes. Kelly Keegan, 4655 Hickory Street, owner of Chicago Dog House. Uh, we're just, we want to be able to sell uh, beer in the park, at Turner Park, when they have the uh, the events that they have scheduled for Thursdays throughout the summer. Um, with the temporary license, with the Class A, we're only allowed uh, a minimal number, but there's going to be as many as 16 events in Turner Park this summer. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other proponents? See none. Any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Jerem. Yes, I think Kelly does a good job, and I'm sure when there's the events, there'll be a request to waive Rule Seven or whatever our rule is that talks about alcohol in parks. So don't forget to comply with that extra step. But wish you luck. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you, Ms. Milton. Oh, I just wanted to say, 
Thank you, because ever since you opened, my husband has been very happy. He's from Chicago, and I know you know him well, and he's been very pleased that he can get his Chicago hot dog when he wants to get it. So thank you. Thanks. Motion and a second. Roll call. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Milton? Yes. Paul? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's, a do it's approved. 6-0. Item number 12, Benson Brewery, 6059 Maple Street, request permission for addition uh, of a storage shed to the south of their location behind 6057 Maple Street. We have a communications from their attorney requesting a one-week layover and the continuation of the public hearing. So moved. Second. Roll call. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Milton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's laid over six to zero. Item number 13 is Rojas Mexican Grill and Margarita Bar, 17010 Wright Plaza. Request permission for a special designated license for a beer garden on May 5th from, one, uh, from 11 a.m. to 2 a.m. with music ending at 1 a.m. Public hearing on number 13 is today. Are there any proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Second. There should be. We sure can. Yeah. Okay. Second. There's a motion to layover and a second. Um, we wish through the motion. Uh, the, the Mexican special doesn't need a license. They're not here. The, uh, I think just layover one week with the desire that we contact the applicant and yeah. have them come down for come down. the meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a motion and a second to do that. Roll call. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Milton? Yes. Pauls? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Laid over one week, six to zero. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7C, the agenda items number 14 through 17 should be laid over for two weeks. Uh, consent agenda. Any member of the City Council may cause an item placed on a consent agenda to be removed. Items removed from consent agenda shall be taken up by City Council immediately following the consent agenda in the order in which they were removed unless otherwise provided by the City Council Rules of Order. Public hearings on agenda items number 18 through 19 were held on March 18th. Second. Roll call. <coughs> Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Milton? Yes. Paul? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. They're both passed seven or six to zero. Public hearings on agenda items number 20 through 35 are today. If you wish to address the City Council regarding these items, please come to the microphone, indicate the agenda item number you wish to address, identify yourself by name, address, and who you represent, and if you are a proponent or an opponent. Seeing none, public hearings closed. Motion approved. Roll call. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Milton? Yes. Paul? Yes. Gernat? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. They're all adopted seven to zero. Resolution item number 36, resolution that attached 3133 Marcy Mason Tax Increment Financing Redevelopment Project Plan for the Redevelopment Project Site located at 3070 Mason Street, 3216 Marcy Street, 811 South 33rd Street, and 3101 Marcy Street with the purpose to completely rehabilitate four residential multi-unit structures uh, recommending the city participate through TIF financing to offset eligible costs uh, is hereby approved. And we have communications in support. Public hearing on number 36 is today. Proponents, Ms. Hadley. Good afternoon, Bridget Hadley, City Planning. Uh, before you is a project that um, is within the Leavenworth Neighborhood Association and as stated, there is support from that Le Leavenworth Neighborhood Association for the project. Um, this pro project, of course, being in the Leavenworth Neighborhood Association, where there is a mix of single-family houses and multi-family structures. Many of those structures in that neighborhood um, have code violations, and several of them actually have demolition orders. So this particular project um, is helping to revitalize that area and supports the, the city's master plan and the Park Avenue redevelopment goals to revitalize and help with infill in that particular neighborhood. <coughs> um, as, it, as stated, it is rehabilitating four uh, different multifamily residential properties, um, at least nine row homes. To point that out, this is 33rd Street and this is 31st. 
This is Marcy, and this is Mason, excuse me, and this is Mason. So there are nine uh, row homes or townhomes here, the duplex, and then the 12 unit multifamily uh, apartment complex. All of it will be rehabilitated. And the idea and the vision of the developer, which the city does share, is to provide quality housing in the neighborhood to encourage eventually a for sale product. Um, we know that the more ownership there is in the neighborhoods, that does bring more of a sense of pride and uh, revitalization to the community. Not to say that tenants do not. Tenants definitely do have pride in their neighborhood as well. But the more we see home ownership in this neighborhood, um, we know that that will help to revitalize it. Did just a little study, demographic study, and this uh, neighborhood is predominantly in the 3900 census tract. And in that census tract, according to the American Community Service between, survey rather, the, from the U.S. Uh, census, between 28, or 2008 and two, uh, 2012, um, it shows that there's 83% uh, rental units versus 17% owner occupied. So lots of work to be done in terms of bringing home ownership into the community and that's what this can eventually do. These are rental properties. The idea is that if these can sell and turn into for sale owned by um, individuals, individual families, then that's what those would become under the tip. Um, it is definitely meeting the community development law. The amount of the TIF is up to 225000 and it is an investment of about $3 million uh, for the total project. And with that, I'd entertain any questions, but ask for your approval. Are there any, any other proponents today that want to speak? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Jeremy. Yes, Jerry, could you come on up? Jerry Reimer, 4880 South 131st Street, Suite 3. So I'd, I've kind of lost count on how many millions you and your partners, investors, have put into this area, but I want to thank you for your continued investment, giving an opportunity to, to put in a, a one-minute plug for what you're doing and you. where you see things happen, going here. Okay. Um, you know, I think as we're all beginning to see that the apartments in the area are beginning to take off, and I think that model's being proved out. Um, other developers can now come into the area and get comparables, so the banks will loan the money, the appraisers will appraise, because we have the rent comparables, the square footage comparables. I personally view the, sing or the multifamily as a funnel. We're pouring people into the funnel, into, into the, you know, kind of the, the newer Class A uh, uh, apartments in the area. Um, in the past in this neighborhood, a lot of the uh, tenant base is probably more than one economic uh, rung on the economic ladder away from being able to buy a home. And so, um, you know, it's a lot of times people will come into a neighborhood and kind of rent it and test it first before they buy. And so by creating some apartments where, you know, the tenant has the option probably financially to either rent or to buy, we've let them test the neighborhood. And now they're telling us that, hey, we'd like to be able to buy, you know, some of the perceptions that people may have had in the past aren't what they're actually experiencing and so forth. And so, um, you know, we, we hope to be able to start uh, be able to sell these townhomes. And then that gets a comparable for the appraisers. Then the guys, be, you know, behind us wants to do a single family home or two or three can now get the necessary appraisal so they can get the bank loan. And, you know, they don't have to just go put lipstick on the product. They can actually, you know, get the full amount of funding that they'll really need to do a project right to upgrade the infrastructure of the plumbing, the electrical, you know, the public safety issues that exist in some of these homes that oftentimes are overlooked because, frankly, people's budgets are just, you know, inadequate to do that. The other thing I wanted to touch on a little bit is the very public discussion we've had in the last couple of years with regard to code enforcement properties and the extensive backlog we have on our demolition list. Uh, in this particular three block area, uh, four blocks to five blocks south of Leavenworth, um, Jerry and his partners have taken it upon themselves to be, and some of the other investors now that have come in behind you, to identify these properties and at their expense uh, perform the demolition. So I'd like to maybe if you could share what your, your thinking is there. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we are fundamentally not advocates of tearing properties down. Um, we think many, many of these properties in the area are beautiful and, in fact, are restorable. Now, with that said, we do find that, you know, one solution set doesn't uh, fit for every single property. There are some properties that we do believe are just so far beyond their economic useful life that it is appropriate to tear those down. There's others that are rehabable. Um, one of the things we do see with an opportunity, um, we actually tore a house down right here. It's still showing us here, but, you know, does it, and in my vision of building new homes, we, you know, we envision making them fit into the neighborhood, being almost in, indistinguishable architecturally in different ways from, you know, the, the fabric of the neighborhood. But, you know, does it send a different message to the banking community, the appraisal community, if someone's actually building a new house versus rehabbing a house? And again, we think it does send different messages, different, you know, people are going to read into it differently. And so having a, a mix of new, old, rehab, and, you know, the diversity of the product we think lends itself to more uh, solution sets to uh, fix the neighborhood. If you would allow me just a second to put a plug in, I think there's other projects that are either coming or done or coming in front of you, but another gentleman named Stephen Held has bought a couple of these pro properties here, and he is uh, going to put townhomes there. This is an example of a concept that we have that we won't necessarily partner financially, but we would like to partner with, you know, our people in our community. We partner in principle. And so if they share the vision of doing, you know, quality projects, then we try to help. So this 12-unit uh, apartment building was, was one that was in really need of repair and so forth, and that's why it's uh, here. The motivating factor for me personally to go and do this particular project was that, hey, I will go take care of the apartment because I know how to handle that. And Stephen, then you go ahead and take care of the houses and come in with the townhomes. And again, we're not financially, you know, partnered, but in principle, we're sharing the same vision. I can go create a, you know, a, a better bookend for him there. And then, frankly, he gets townhomes here, and then it, you know, reinforces and makes it that much easier for me to rent units. And I think everyone can see that in a relatively short period of time of, of four years, what you've been able to do from Park Avenue now expanding outwards. And, you know, a lot of people are fond of talking the talk, but very few walk the walk and put their money where their mouth is. And, and here's a group of people before us today that have taken the, if not the worst, this top two in my district in areas of need of improvement in terms of the overall housing stock and quality of, of life that, that was there for people trying to get by, high crime rates that are coming down uh, dramatically. Um, the schools now seeing the benefit of that with, with more kids coming into them. And, and so we don't get a whole lot of fun success stories to talk about, but here's one, and I want to just thank you. Thank you. I'd like to just acknowledge one other guy, because Lonnie, is a guy in uh, Mr. Gannett's district at about 18th and Vinton Street, and he's another guy that we partnered in principle with, and we share the concept, and he's now taking this model and moving it over into the Vinton Street neighborhood there. And so I think w one thing we have, I, I believe, that developers aren't that darn original, and we're not that creative. You know, we go build Home Depot big boxes the same all over the country. So we need to figure out models that work because then we can go and replicate them in other neighborhoods. So, you know, I'm proud that we've got a model that's working here. And I guess, you know, the best uh, form of flattery is if people start copying it. Thank you. Ms. Milton. Thank you. One question. And, and Bridget, I don't, uh, either one of you could answer this. Bridget, you mentioned that uh, many of the, the homes here are on a demolition list. Um, which obviously the city would end up having to pay for, and we're, we don't have enough money currently in our budget to demolish all the homes that, that need to go. How many homes are going to be taken care of by this project, by, by you, Jerry? I mean, as far as demoing? Right. There's no, no homes being demoed as part of this project. Are you rehabbing all of those in the, in the red right there off, yeah, these off are Marcy? All, these are all being rehabbed. This is being rehabbed, and this is being rehabbed. Okay, so you're rehabbing all of these. You're our, not even demolishing. That is our first and foremost priority. I'm just simply saying there are cases where it's just not that realistic. The buildings are too far gone. And so in that cases, um, I, I believe the council member referenced a, a burnout property up here on 32nd and Pacific that my partner and I purchased, and it was on the demo list. And uh, we are in the preparation of getting a plan, but we went ahead and demoed it right away because, you know, it just 
you know, it was burnout, it was a hazard, children could go play in it, and so we're just trying to make the, you know, the danger go away as quickly as possible. Well, thank you for doing that, and actually that's even better that you're able to rehab these properties. You know, that's our first and foremost objective. I'm just, it's not always practical. Okay. Well, thank you. And th this looks great. If I could just add, just, yes, yeah, so it's just these properties in red and blue that are a part of this TIF project, and it just happens that these particular projects are within a Leavenworth, the Leavenworth Neighborhood Association or Leavenworth Neighborhood where there are a lot of code violations and some that have demolition orders, not these specifically. And if I can put in one more plug that um, what we've been um, able to do with the use of TIF is what um, the Housing and Community Development Division has been doing around the city but mostly in the eastern part of the city. And so um, as Jerry has said, We've been able to allow them to use TIF to create a model that works for the private sector to come in and, and really do urban infill and revitalize the, the urban core. And so to the extent that this can really work, we, we may see this more in the eastern part of Omaha. So we think it's a, a great tool to be able to have for them. Thank you, Mr. Pauls. Thank you. I have, thank you, Mr. President. I have a question. Uh, we do not demolish because we see value in that property, is what I've been told by Jerry. If you see, is there, do you have a, uh, a model that you use and say this should or should not be demolished? I personally do not, um, and maybe our planning director can speak to that. There are, I know, some criteria, but I, I do not make that determination. Okay. So I would defer to our planning director. Okay. Well, Councilman, if I may, yes. uh, James the uh, planning director. Each uh, property is kind of individual. You kind of take a look at that property and see what uh, how much needs to be done. If there are structural problems, for example, that typically that house is, is, is probably not economically uh, salvable. This is one example. Whereas uh, lighter deterioration can be fixed up and it, and it, uh, and it would, uh, would be able to be reclaimed. Usually, however, once a property hits the point where we've issued a demolition order, it is beyond the pale at that time. Okay, so if I have a question about a, a certain property, you could probably give me some uh, advice on uh, how I should take a look at that property, then if it should be uh, saved or uh, uh, reutilized in a different way. Could I get that information from you? Uh, uh, yes, Councilman James Thiel again. Uh, as part of our uh, code enforcement pro process, we write up what needs to be done. We do include an estimate of what the uh, rehabilitation costs uh, should be. Uh, of course, that will vary with the uh, depending on how much rehab the individual wants to do. Uh, so we do provide some assistance from that standpoint to get people for a feel uh, for whether it really is salvageable or not. But we would encourage people to do their own analysis, of course. Okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I want to thank you and, uh, and thank uh, people such as Jerry who are going back in some of these neighborhoods uh, because I find more, jo more joy in taking a look at some of these projects than I do for some of those that happen to fit into uh, the area that I represent out in western Omaha. Uh, we probably need to take a look at more of these and get some of those developers <clears throat> who want to take on some apartment um, issues in western Omaha, take a look at maybe coming into this part of the city and utilize some of their uh, expertise there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to be brief, but the first thing I want to do, Jerry, thank you as well. Um, doesn't have to be in my district for me to appreciate it. Um, in the older parts of the city where we're trying to really get some work done, um, I appreciate the efforts that you and, and, and other developers are attempting to, to make in, in terms of addressing some of the concerns of the older, older, part, older parts of the city. Um, I think there's still considerable value here, and I think you all recognize that too, and, and we have to continue to keep working at it. I would encourage others, uh, my colleagues here, to take the ride that I took with Councilmember Jerem a, a couple of weeks ago because it, it's, it's really good. To, I mean, it's okay to look at the diagrams here and to look at the, the uh, aerial drawings and so forth, but when you, when you drive those neighborhoods and see the development that's occurring and some of the changes that are taking place, it is exciting, I think, and it bodes well for the future if we can continue to keep getting developers 
as you said, Councilmember Pauls, to get involved in, in some of the older parts of the city because there are a number of homes in the eastern part of our city that are easily rehabable. Um, and we need to be about the business of doing that. There's some ap ap that absolutely have to be torn down. There's, we have no choice in that, but, you know, because they're too far gone. But, you know, for the most part, we have some properties that I can't, that I think can be saved. And if you drive through the, that particular neighborhood, as I did with Councilmember Jerem a couple of weeks ago, you can actually see, you know, on the ground what's going on and how those neighborhoods are advancing and changing. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. No further lights? Motion approved. Roll call. Gray? Yes. Jerem? Yes. Milton? Yes. Paul? Yes. Garnett? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. It's adopted 6 to 0. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7, if agenda item number 37 shall be laid over three weeks for publication and public hearing. Ordinance on second reading, item number 38, ordinance approving a redevelopment tax and financing loan agreement with Nicholas Flats LLC to implement the Nicholas Flats tax and financing redevelopment project plan located at 1015 North 16th Street, which contemplates the demolition of an existing structure and a new construction of a five-story multifamily structure, which contains 67 modern and eco-friendly apartment units, 50 private parking stalls, including garages, units, on the, and a commercial space on the first floor. Public hearing on number 38 is today. Proponents, please. Ms. Hadley. Bridget Hadley, City Planning, here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any other proponents today? <laughs> Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Item number 39, ordinance to amend Omaha Municipal Code section 36-156 to <coughs> specify the distance for stopping, standing, and parking in front of private driveways. Public hearing on number 39 is today. Proponents, please. Please come, yeah. Just name and address there for the record. Address? Name, name and address? address. Yeah. Well, Shafiq Coleman, 1617 Evans Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68111. Basically, um, <laughs> I've just noticed that as far as cars and stuff coming around, like being parked outside your house and stuff, you know, just right up on your driveway when you're backing out, some of these streets, when you back out, you cannot see right beside you know right around you so basically <laughs> this is my first time over here sorry you're doing fine but uh basically when you're backing out your driveway there's always a blind side and i've been in an accident i've had a car hit me head on coming over a hill just real fast and this was on 13th and martha street and we can kind of richard zajic this is right by his house and and i mean you know there's different houses that when you back out that driveway you know, you're looking and you don't see anything and then there's people flying down the hill, especially off of 13th and Martha. They're flying over the hill and you're backing out that driveway and I got hit head on. And you know, went to the hospital instantly, you know what I'm saying? Because they tore my car up. But I noticed that when I back outside my yard at home, you know, there's there's just so many cars that you can hit. There's so many people that just don't pay attention to you coming out. And basically, I just think that we should get a distance. We should have some kind of distance in between that. You know, as far as, you know, if it's a little ways away from your driveway, I mean, that's your personal area, your personal space kind of to come out and go out in the street. So I don't know what else. Okay. <laughs> so just kind of voice my opinion on that. You did good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, any other proponents that want to speak today? Please come down. That's right. Richard Zajic, 1411 Martha Street. And he's a new homeowner, brand new, this year. And he's now beginning to realize, even though he would come to my house a lot, that his driveway is now being crowded. I mean, we're talking both sides. And he's got a double wide opening, and he still has big truck to get out of there. And they refuse to get off your driveways. They think walking another additional feet with their legs is going to cause them major pain. It really, it's come to that. And then, then of course, I've also got the Sokol events that take place, and this gets really bad. I mean, every crook and cranny they can cram into. I've had a probably, in the last five years, probably close to 30 cars that I have actually been able to get towed because they've actually blocked the driveway. And the night he had his accidents was because they had pushed so tight against my driveway, he's trying to get out, you come over the hill, and they just slammed right into it.
because he's got to watch the distance on both sides. Plus, now you have no room to swing. You've got to actually cut off both lanes to get out. To where if we were given at least three foot on either side of the openings from the back end of their car or the front end of their car, not their tires, where their car is sitting, then you have room when you're going to your right, you can swing more to your left before you get out of your driveway. So you only cover up one lane and not two. And every time I call the police, it depends on the policeman arriving, he decides whether or not it's blocking me too much. Okay? And I said, what do you mean? I thought we had either side of the opening. Up there, contacting Gary, I was informed that no, it just says opening. doesn't say you have to be away from that opening. And they could have determined that. I think everybody, especially in the older neighborhoods, where they're trying to fit two cars in a one-car spot, and they're trying to jam them in there, and all the homes, which used to be owned in my block, now have become more tenants. Sorry, I see the opposite happening when it comes to tenants. They have no, they don't want to, they can know they can leave that neighborhood at any time. They don't care that, you know, other people are trying to be common courtesy to their neighbors, okay? And so I think the order needs, needs to specify, and I say three feet either side of your opening, and I say the opening is where the curb goes back to the full height. Okay? I think that's what it needs to be. And because right now, like I said, I'll call the police. They'll come out here. I had one policeman say, well, when you need to back out, call me. I'll pull behind you and turn on my red lights. Okay, that's kind of stupid. If I'm telling you it's dangerous or I'm telling you I'm having to jump, in order to get out there, or I have to watch somebody back up. This needs to be addressed. And it's easy. In the older neighborhoods, especially where the lanes are smaller, we have more cars because what used to be single family dwellings, now they're fitting as many adults as they can into the building, so you end up with that many more cars. And they have to understand sometimes you've got to walk to your home. If you don't have a driveway, yeah, you're going to end up walking. Nobody likes to walk. Although I disagree with that, um, you got to walk. Otherwise, it's going to cost you. Either your car gets towed, or there's a major—I mean, a major fine. Get them off the driveways. And that's what I, I had talked to Gary about. I said, you know, it just seems it's a battle every week for me because of the Sokol. But it's also—I have currently happen to have a brand new set of renters who thinks that they can fit two Hondas in a one-car spot. So every time I go out, I'm having to jostle around in order to get out of my driveway. And I just think if it's known that there is now a distance, people would, res hopefully people would respect it, or pay you to park there. You pay enough time to park there, maybe you'll quit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I know the exact hill you're talking about. I was, <laughs> I was there Saturday night for a very successful event, by the way, for the Benson Theater Project at uh, the Soquel yeah. Auditorium. But there were lots of cars there, and I think I witnessed what you just described a little bit. Are there any other proponents that want to speak today? Seeing none, we'll, we'll ask any, for any opponents. Seeing none, Mr. Grenant. Thank you, Mr. President. For several years, I've been monitoring a wide variety of, of nuisances uh, that you hear about at neighborhood meetings and coffee shop talks and over the backyard fence and get complaints at, uh, at our offices here at City Hall uh, through 911, the police department, th those types of entities. W one in particular kept popping up uh, and that was the one in regards to blocking driveways. Uh, eastern part of Omaha, more pronounced as opposed to the western part of our city. Under the current law, uh, section G, uh, or paragraph G of section 36, uh, it, the driveway has to be blocked physically by a vehicle for law enforcement to either ticket and or tow. They have that ability now. One of the things that was always disappointing to me, especially when I was a supervisor in my other life, is when officer was called to a situation and 
say, such as this, maybe it wasn't blocking the driveway, but the front end of the vehicle was smack dab on the edge of the driveway, causing our, our senior citizens, our handy capable people, uh, those that may have limited restrictions on their driver's licenses, problems in entering and exiting their driveways. Needed to take a look at this. And it was frustrating for me when officers, including myself, had to tell the complainant, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. There's no more, there's nothing more frustrating for a complainant to, to hear after they've taken the time out to report something that's important to them, uh, and, and there's nothing that they could do. Well, I think we've reached the time to sharpen that tool a little bit. Uh, we have ordinances on the books now that uh, prohibit cars from parking within 15 feet of a fire hydrant. We have ordinances on the books that prohibit parking within 30 feet of a fire station, within 10 feet of a stop sign. I think those aforementioned people or anybody that lives in a, a high dense area or an area of our city that has a problem like this, some relief. And I think this provides such relief. There are other cities that have these types of restrictions. So I, I would like to have everybody please keep in mind that this is a complaint-generated type call. There will not be a parking SWAT team out there looking for these violators. Okay? It's not going to come down to that. We don't have the resources for that. Rich calls in a complaint. It goes into, if he calls in 911 or he calls me, uh, and I turn around and call 911 with it, it's going to get the same priority and goes through the same set of circumstances like every other call does that comes in to that center. And then the police are dispatched according to that priority. So it's not that they're going to be out sneaking in the bushes, you know, looking for these types of complaints. That's not the purpose of this. It, will not happen. There will be no change in police procedure. It will be handled the same way as any other call that comes in uh, on a complaint generated type situation. Another thing that I've noticed in my research that was, was brought up this morning in regard at our pre-council meeting was the fact that uh, well, wouldn't this pit neighbor against neighbor? I've seen the exact opposite in the research. We're not developing a neighborhood full of snitches. You know, if it happens, we would ha if this is passed, we would have a measure in place that will deal with it. Right now, we don't. This would give that measure. So where an officer can come up and say, yes, we can do something about this and issue a ticket. Now, what I used to train my crew as when they went up and it was in a situation, we'd make every effort to try to find the owner of that vehicle or the person that was in charge of that vehicle. And I'm sure Rich has seen that when he came up and described a couple of incidences that happened to him, that they would at least give that effort to find out the owner of that vehicle and say, look, you, you're in violation of such and such would you be kind enough to move and properly park your vehicle? And in about over 90% of the cases that I have found, this is what takes place. And if we could provide that tool, uh, I think we would be doing a service, not a disservice. Now granted, we have pockets of density in our housing stock in Omaha. In the eastern part of the city, more, I think, more pronounced. Common sense prevails here between the time the call comes in from the complainant, the police respond, and attempt to notify the violator. Common sense, it goes back to what I just got through saying what the police can do 
and typically that's what they still do. I've been gone for 14 years now, but I know for a fact that they still have that same procedure and they'll make every attempt to find that violator. If not, then there are options of ticketing and towing to clear that violation. <coughs> but again, common sense prevails and it's over 90% of the time it works. I would ask my colleagues for your support. So once again, we won't have to, your phone ringing or my phone ringing or someone down here at City Hall's phone ringing saying, hey, the cops told me that there was nothing that they could do. <coughs> so I, I would ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And Mr. Garnett, um, I know you did a good job of sending out uh, the information to neighborhood associations and requesting feedback. And I can say the ones I saw from my district were all very supportive. Was that how you'd characterize the ones you received back citywide? Uh, the, the feedback that I have been uh, extremely supportive, I think there's been a number of emails uh, from various neighborhood groups that have come back. A count on that. That's from around Some of them in here. There's a bunch of them in here. There's like six or seven or eight neighborhood associations that, that, have, that, have, that have come back in the affirmative. Nine, about nine or ten that have come back so far in support so there is a i think a, a, at least a consensus in the southern part uh southeastern part of our city that there, there's something amiss here and it needs to be addressed and i'm sure when you look at a metropolitan city our size that it's going to be there's a problem citywide it's not just on martha street you know it could be everywhere that you have uh, a density problem or there's an event of some sort at whatever venue that might be not not just in southeast omaha but north midtown west omaha so if we can provide that tool i think this is just something effective and i want everybody to be assured that uh, i'll do everything that i possibly can not to let that happen and that being where we would have them out purposely looking for these types of violations. Be assured that this is a complaint generated avenue that is currently in place and that there would be the same procedures handling any type of call that would come in. It gets prioritized and the appropriate police response <coughs> assigned. So I would thank you and I'd make a motion to approve. Uh, just oh, sorry, I jumped the gun by one week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Miss Milton. No, I just wanted to add one thing, and there, it, and actually, there was a person that contacted me in opposition to this that lives in Mr. Jaron's uh, district, and her only concern was. Am I going to get a ticket if I choose to park too close to my own driveway? And that that was her, that was her concern. And so I just want to make it clear that it's this body's legislative intent <laughs> that it's complaint based so that if somebody perhaps receives a ticket and it's their own driveway that they're violating that that is not the that's not the intent of this of this ordinance that it is a complaint based and you would have to be affecting somebody else and somebody else would have to call and so absolutely and again i could not stress enough that if that came came in and I responded to your residence and it was your car blocking your driveway. I would make every attempt to say, ma'am, would you please, it's in violation. And I'm sure that you would comply, especially if your driveway was completely clear and you could pull into it. So that's the common sense, the types of things that I was referring to uh, in that particular case. And uh, and I fully understand the constituents' concern uh, uh, in any district, not, not just Councilman Jerem, but this will apply citywide. Well, that's okay. I told her to go ahead and complain to Mr. Jerem. <laughs> 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 Mr. Mr. Jerem, the rebuttal. <laughs> no, I, I was one of the ones in his office before to say, I can see in my district this may not be as popular in some areas because 
as council member Pauls, who used to live in my district, pointed out with astute accuracy is parking is limited to one side of the street in, in many, many cases. And so you create this the demand in many cases exceeds supply on the street. And um, people do park right up to the driveways. And that's exacerbated in the areas where there are high schools, like in Mercy High School in Duchenne, where you know sophomores, juniors, and seniors are driving to school and there's not enough parking. Well, in Mercy's case, there's no on-campus parking. and Duchenne's, there's limited. And so um, I could see some people uh, being concerned that this might create problems. That's why uh, at least I was put somewhat at ease as to the fact that the same people that have supply and demand issues now are so somewhat concerned about and leave the notes on the Mercy Girls cars to remind them to be good citizens and not block driveways. Uh, we as a neighborhood try to go that way sometimes that people do involve the police and the police come around and they do ticket enforcement. I haven't seen any cars towed, but I'm, I'm hopeful that the assurances that, that Gary has given us will, will work. But yeah, I was in his office asking him about it because I could see, and in my neighborhood in particular, that that would be a concern. Thank you. No further lights. Public hearing is closed. Pursuant to City Council Rule 70, the public hearing on agenda items 40 through 46 shall be held on third reading. Pursuant to City Council Rule 7C, the public hearing on agenda items 47 through 53 shall be held on the second reading. Motion adjourned. Roll call. Gray. Yes. Jerem. Yeah. Milton. Yeah. Paul. Yes. Kernan. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. We are adjourned at 247. See